We all have darkness inside us, a secret side of ourselves we keep hidden away. But what would happen if our darkest urges manifested into a living, breathing person? Ask writer Thad Beaumont, because that's exactly what happened when his pseudonym, George Stark, came to life and started murdering people close to him. Iconic horror filmmaker George Romero teams with master of horror Stephen King for a look into the darkest aspects of the human psyche in the dark half. I'm Connor Izagari. And I'm Austin Johnson. And this is Filmgasm. Happy Wednesday and welcome to the Filmgasm podcast where we dig into genre films, mostly horror. Today we're back in Stephen King's world, a place we never seem to leave very often and I'm very happy about that. Today's topic, The Dark Half, is a very interesting story but kind of a subpar movie and uh, we'll get into that. But first I've got one update for you of, on the Rewind, a fun fact that takes us back to episode 50, our look back on the career of Philip Seymour Hoffman. Back in 2005, when the American remake of The Office was being developed for NBC, PSH was offered the lead role of regional manager Michael Scott. He turned it down, presumably because he was not interested in going to TV, and the role went to Steve Carell, who became a superstar because of it. What would you, like, can you picture Philip Seymour Hoffman in The Office? Yeah, I can, because I, he can do anything, but I, I, I'm glad he didn't do it. Yeah, imagine the films he would have missed out on if he'd taken that exactly. role. Exactly. And just the, yeah, yeah. The films, the respect that he does have as a, a, a movie man, a film film kind of guy. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. And also, he, like, the career that would have been taken away from Steve Carell. That, that, too. We wouldn't have seen the great performances, you know, in Little Miss Sunshine or Foxcatcher or... Uh, the big short or whatever you prefer. Uh, he's had an awesome career. And he did such a great job of balancing the arrogance and childlike innocence of Michael Scott. That just yeah. works so well over the course of that show. Yeah. I'm I'm not like a huge office fan, but Steve Carell is damn funny in that show. Uh, once Michael Scott goes, that show kind of goes for me a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. I think most people felt that way. I like the office. I've been, I'm actually in the middle of a kind of, half-assed rewatch of that i'm on the second season it's just it's so funny it's so uncomfortable at times but it's so funny <laughs> did you did you see that they're having to like adjust certain things about the show because of of uh certain racial slurs that are in it or whatever yeah yeah i did i i don't think that's the right way to handle it i that's that's tough yeah i don't like erasing these things i think just you know fess up to it say yeah we fucked up this is wrong but here's what we did like leave it up to the to the audience to whether or not they choose to watch it that's the way i think they should do it warner brothers did a great job of, of doing that one with, with their looney tunes yeah and i think that's how they should like for example they cut an episode of the golden girls that supposedly features them in blackface but i heard that it's actually supposed to be like mud masks like they're at a spa Ah, so I mean, <laughs> where are we going to draw the line here? Yeah, that yeah, that's I've asked that a lot about stuff. Where are we going to draw the line with a lot of things? We, yeah, what? Or, yeah, there's so much we have to change if that's the attitude, you know. We're putting way too much effort into censoring television, where we should be putting that effort towards reorganizing the police force and making sure that people aren't getting killed. That's what should be the priority here. I don't know why people have suddenly translated that into let's erase certain episodes of TV. That's not going to fix anything. Yeah. Yeah, that stuff happens. You know, I think it's more interesting to watch The Office now and be like, oh, man, look how far comedy has come where yeah. you can't write those certain things, you know, and I think that's good to kind of – you pointed that out with um, last week when we were kind of talking about Gone with the Wind, right? And how it's been taken off of, or it's being taken off of HBO Max, I believe. Yeah. And it's kind of like, well, shouldn't we see what's happened in history? That sort of attitude, you know? So it's, it's tough, man. It's, it's a gray situation with each TV show and each movie that comes along. Because let's be honest, um, a lot of the movies we've talked about in here, a lot of movies we're going to talk about in the future, there are certain aspects of it that are not, you know, politically correct, but... Uh, you know, it's, it's art, it's a movie and 
you got to try, try to get better as, as you move on. You can disagree with the content of something. You can say, like, this is horrible, this is racist, I, I disagree with this. But you have to acknowledge that it exists. You can't just erase it and pretend that it, it never happened. That's, that's what I take issue with. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want people to get confused with where we stand. I mean, of course, we, we talked about, um, for anyone who listens, we also have an Oscar Sunday show. And our first, first episode was about Pulp Fiction. And we brought up and talked about that ridiculous, audacious, stupid scene where Quentin Tarantino is saying stuff he shouldn't be saying, like point blank, period. Yeah. And, now as, and now as time has progressed, he doesn't do that anymore. He learned, I truly believe he learned, and he, with himself, obviously his characters in his movies do. I'm talking about himself. It's way, way, way different when you are writing a character for Samuel L. Jackson, and you're doing these things, or you're writing Calvin Candy for Leo, and he's doing these certain things. But when you write this character for yourself... (laughs) Yeah, that's pretty (laughs) fucked up. And and, the N-word for five minutes, that's pretty fucked up. Yeah, yeah, and we we talked about that. We're always going to bring those things up because that's going to dock points off of a movie for us here at Filmgas, and we just don't. We're just like, what's the fucking point of that kind of shit? But we're not going to completely disregard the entire piece of work, right? And we're not going to uh, erase and take that scene out of the movie and then just pretend it never happened because you don't learn anything that way. Exactly. You have you, exactly to progress. You have to you have to see the yeah. mistakes that have been made in the past to correct yourself. So yeah, I, I think we're on the same page and I really hope our listeners understand that it's just art, art is ever changing and always moving. And uh, I hope it keeps adapting. It's like when you get in trouble for something, denying it gets nobody anywhere, but fessing up and acknowledging your mistake and learning from it, we can progress. That's a hundred percent. That's how it works. Well, <laughs> hell yeah. Now on to a movie that has absolutely nothing to do with racism or society at all. Hey, hey, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we can give our five minutes of what we, how we feel. And yeah, um, that's, that's what we believe. But um, at the end of the day, this is a podcast about movies. And you, you, you very well know that you can go to much better resources for actual news. This is, this is strictly about... Yeah. Strictly about this is strictly about movies. Uh, if you want to know about movies, come to Filmgasm. But uh, we definitely, we definitely feel the same way, Connor. And I'm glad we can share how we feel on the platform, but also talk about movies as well. Because um, yeah. I, I, I am someone who does need to kind of decompress and let my brain just kind of r- ride the wave of a movie or a book or or some music. Um, whether, whether people look at that as weak or not, I don't really care. That's what I have to do for my, for my mental, mental state. So uh, we're going to talk about the dark half today. <laughs> yeah, I see this podcast as very therapeutic. It's definitely a great way to just kind of unpack everything and just kind of, you know, throw that into the discussion. Yeah, we've always done that. Yeah, 100%. We'll, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue. And you and I, the way we are, I mean, as people, we want to, we're, we're always stuffing our brains with as much stuff as we can to, to learn and to grow and to try to be better as people. And, uh, you know, we're both young, but we're, we're trying our best, you know? Yeah, exactly. So prior to this show, had you ever heard of The Dark Half? Like, were you familiar with this film and book? No, 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 not at all. This is, th- this, okay, this is great because this is where you, where you draw the line in the sand dude (laughs) where this is where the stephen king fans that are like me where it's like yeah i like stephen king he's like i've read a couple books you know they're they're really good he's an incredible writer most of the big time movies are good right you know stand by me shawshank you know the, the new it's that stuff i really like the shining obviously but uh dark half that's a um that's more up your alley you're more in the circle of intense Stephen King fans who you really like to read all the stuff, then watch the movie. So um, what, what is your relationship with the dark half? So I'm definitely a King purist. I've, I try to read and see as much as I can. Yeah. I hadn't read the dark half prior to this show. I hadn't, it's, it's just been on my shelf. I didn't really know much about it. Uh, I read the book prior to the to recording um, over the past few weeks. Cause I wanted to be familiar with it. I wanted to have yeah. something to base the movie off of something to compare 
And it's a solid story. It's very much a story just about, you know, identity and who you are when you're writing, like is a little bit different than who you are every day. It's, you know, I'm a writer as well. So I, I, I know what that means. I know what that feels like when you're writing something that's really fucked up, that's violent, that's grisly. You try to separate your own self from that story. You know, it's not what you think. It's not what you feel, but it is in you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. hundred percent. I definitely know what you mean. And that goes down to, uh, if you're like someone who creates stuff, when you're pouring anything that you actually feel, you, you feel it, man, you know, and it, yeah. it shows. And then it shows. It really does. You know, personal stuff is always the best, right? Yeah, for sure. And King's, like, some of his best stuff comes from actually writing about writing. And Exactly. Yeah, The Dark Half is such a great book. It's got such a great, just consistent, creepy, unsettling tone that the movie... I don't think grasped as well as it could have and should have. It ended up being kind of a meh, you know, yeah, all right, kind of movie. Like, nothing special. You know, only the diehard King fans and, like, super horror buffs are really going to find this one. There's no casual, like, movie buff who's just like, oh, yeah, I love the dark half. Yeah, and he here I am. I, you know, <laughs> I I'm a I'm a film buff who likes to just kind of tackle all kinds of things and the dark half is something that wasn't on my radar and I like to watch things that aren't on my radar. Right. Yeah. And this is, this is one of those where you go into it like, all right, here we go. And you know, you're kind of like, okay, okay. We're on a nice little jog here. And then it just kind of, for me, whew, just felt like uh, it was just kind of running, running to what as the movie went along. I don't know. It's yeah. tough. Yeah. That makes sense. The movie's really anticlimactic. Uh, yeah. So long time listeners will know that, the way we pick films mostly is we do random picks from what we call the book of filmgasm, which has just, you know, over a thousand uh, different potential movie topics. We pick a number, we look in the book and whatever movies next to that number, that's what we're going to do on the show. The dark half was one of those picks turn. And I don't know if it's something we would have chosen on our own, probably eventually, but I am glad it was chosen because there is a lot of interesting stuff here to talk about for sure and uh let's get into it let's do this so the dark half began life as a novel published in 1989 it was king's last novel before he got completely sober and the themes of the novel definitely reflect that definitely you know thad used to be an addict he you know sobered up through his writing he only gets he only drinks and smokes when he's writing his george <laughs> Damn, like it's freaky, you know, to have that kind of. He, he might be schizophrenic. There's definitely ways to read into this one. Um, the idea for the book came from King's own personal battle to maintain anonymity after someone threatened to blab about his pseudonym, Richard Bachman. So, under the Bachman name, King published some of his darkest, most visceral stories, such as Rage, The Long Walk, Roadwork, The Running Man, Thinner. The Regulators, and Blaze. King was outed as Bachman in 1985 after a bookstore clerk noticed similarities between King and Bachman's writing style. King announced the reveal right before the publication of Misery, which was supposed to be a Bachman novel. And he tried the Bachman experiment as a way to kind of see if people are buying his books because of his name or because of the talent of the writing. And in the end, he didn't really get a definitive answer because he was outed before he could really find out about this. But I've read a good chunk of the Bachman books, and it is dark. Like, his, his darkest stuff was written under Bachman, for sure. That's like, so fascinating, because he's like, oh, I'm going to use this to actually get the stuff out that I want to. Yeah. Well, back in the day, typically, you were, as a writer, you would publish one book a year if you were good. If you were prolific. He wanted to write more. He wanted to publish more. So he, you know, Bachman became that, his way of publishing another book. And, uh, like, Rage is about a school shooting. The Long Walk is about kids in a contest to walk the longest across the country, and the last one standing wins, like, everything. It's fucking disturbing. Road work is about a man pushed to the edge of his sanity after a overpass is built through his house, and he's, like, forced to evacuate, and he's like, fuck this, I'm taking this overpass with me. It's insane. 
And then Thinner's about a fat guy who kills a gypsy and gets cursed with uh, weight loss. It's fucking brilliant. And uh, all of those have been, uh, only Thinner and The Running Man have been adapted to film from the Bachman books. And they're both pretty shitty movies. <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I've actually seen Thinner. I, yeah, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> and The Running Man is fucking embarrassing. They turned it into a goofy Arnold Schwarzenegger game show. <coughs> And the book is very much not that. The book's pretty damn serious. Yeah, but that's hilarious. <laughs> and uh, I haven't read The Regulators or Blaze yet, but I've I haven't really heard much about that. I know The Regulators is like a secondary book to Desperation. Okay. And another one I haven't seen. I mean, or uh, read. One day, you know, there's always going to be more King to read. He's prolific as hell. For every one you read, he publishes three more. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, have, <laughs> so the dark half was written and directed by George Romero, iconic horror filmmaker known primarily for his landmark zombie films, night of the living dead, dawn of the dead and day of the dead. He and King were very good friends. They collaborated together on creep show in 1982 and again on the dark half. Romero died in 2017 at age 77 from lung cancer. Dude smoked like a chimney, just nonstop for 50 years. And yeah, I think uh, his friendship with King may have impacted the quality of the film. Cause, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you don't want to, you know, mess with your friend's story. I get that. And uh, it just doesn't, tra- I think a lot of things in the dark half don't translate well. It's, yeah, and that uh, happens, right? That happens with Stephen King stuff for a lot, right? Where it's like, how do you, he's so good at writing. He's so damn good at taking however many pages he wants to describe something that it it's so marvelous and magnificent that it just it's not for film. It's not it's not for the eye necessarily. It's more for imagination. Yeah, uh, and, and of course we've seen it done a lot really well because he has so many great stories that it's it's bound to happen. But we see so many times that these just kind of fall short because a director or a a screenwriter doesn't quite know what to do. The biggest issue when translating King to film that I've noticed is the pace. Because King takes forever to, you know, build up your fence, the tension to establish the world, the characters before shit really takes off. Yeah. Pet Cemetery is the biggest one that has that problem, I think. But the dark half definitely has a lot of that too. Yeah. I I can see that. You can tell when you start watching more, movies that are adapt- from from King's stories, you can see that. You can see how movies sometimes are taking taking these wrong decisions where it's like it's either gonna drag or it's gonna fall short. It's it sucks, man. It's it's just hard. It's difficult. But on the opposite side of that, you have films like like we recently just did 1922. And that was a brilliantly paced, well made adaptation because it it took the time and it took the necessary risks. I thought it was really good. Films like Doctor Sleep. Uh, I'm trying to think of recent stuff. Gerald's Game. It Chapter Two. It Chapter. Both of those. It, it can be done, and it it can be done well, but most of the time it's not. It's it's yeah yeah. We get more shit than we get great films when it comes to King's work. And, and it, it doesn't even need to be looked at it. Yeah, it is like horrible. It's like oh, there's in the tall grass. Uh, there's the I would rather path. have a uh, bad movie than a boring subpar movie. Yeah, because at That's least with a mean. bad movie, you have something to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I definitely know what you mean. You have like a conversation, especially for this kind of a show, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Romero, though, uh, you've, have you seen the the Dead films? Yes, that's it though. That's like really it. I've like tapped into with him. Yeah. That's that's for most people. His outside of zombie films, his other films are really bizarre. <laughs> um I've I haven't seen a lot of them. I've seen about half of Night Riders, which yeah, I haven't seen that. Is such it's it's like a modern day retelling of King Arthur as told by a uh, a traveling biker circus. It's, okay. It's the strangest Shit, Stephen King's in that one, actually. He's uh, in the audience, like, cheering them on. It's very weird. Uh, (laughs) I know Josh just did a review for Monkey Shines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I've heard is very strange. 
Uh, there's this movie, uh, I think it's Martin, a very strange vampire movie. Might be Marvin. I'm not sure. <laughs> it was a long time ago. But obviously Romero is forever going to be known for Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead. And to a further extent, yeah. I think Land of the Dead, that was really good too. Yeah. But the dark half, he will not, that will not be, you know, listed among his greats. Uh, Oscar winner Timothy Hutton stars as both Thad Beaumont and George Stark. Hutton won an Oscar for his performance in 1980's Ordinary People. He has also appeared in such films as Taps, The Good Shepherd, French Kiss, and he had lead roles in TV shows like Leverage, American Crime, The Haunting of Hill House, and Almost Family, the latter of which was canceled right after a credible rape allegation was announced against Hutton. And uh, I actually think he's really good in this. He's the best part of this movie, I think. But mostly is Thad Beaumont. Yeah, 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 100%. Yeah, I agree with you. I think as we talk about this, I really enjoy the first 30, 30, 40 minutes or so. And I think it's due to him as Thad, just kind of like, I, I talked to you before we started recording. I, I don't really like his performance that he won an Oscar for. Yeah. In Ordinary People, I find him to be just a little, it's a little frantic and annoying. You know, just like the way he moves is not, it's not totally my style, right? Yeah. But uh, I agree with you when he's, just working as Thad Beaumont, like when he's first having the confrontation with a guy who's like, hey, man, I know you, you know, I know you got some kind of fucking gimmick going on. He's, that's a good scene. He's good in that scene. And, uh, but as it progresses, I think it gets a little tired. And this movie just makes some decisions in the latter half that I just don't, I don't really like. Fair enough. His performance is, uh, as George Stark, though, is pretty chameleon-like. I don't really see it is. Timothy it Hutton is. in there at all. I thought it was a different yeah. actor until I looked it up. Yeah, it kind of looks like Paxton a little bit. <laughs> kind of, yeah. It reminded me of somebody while I was watching it. I, I don't remember who, but I thought, like, oh, shit, that's gotta, that looks like that guy. I thought of Paxton from 1987, Near Dark, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I can see that, for sure. This is going <laughs> to bother me. Maybe it was Michael McKeon. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I'm in there a little bit. Oh, well. But uh, I think he's a far cry from the George Stark in the novel, who is just like a frightening force of like almost uh, like a psychic force of nature who like knows it can anticipate everybody's move, not just that, but like he knows what everybody's going to do. And he's a lot more powerful with like the way he can manipulate Thad's mind. It's, it's, it was really cool. Like in the book, you really are nervous as to what this guy's going to do next. You really think like he will snap and kill everybody in this room immediately. If it suits him in the movie, he's, he's really kind of watered down. And he's not that much of a, of a frightening character. I was actually kind of disappointed. Yeah. A little bit more like if <laughs> It feels like there's times where this sort of menacing kind of character is in these scenes, like, eh, whatever, you know. When yeah, you should be should be ah, you know, screaming, frightening, like you don't want to be anywhere near this guy. Yeah. I don't know. If, it, yeah, it fell short a bit there. I think that happens a lot with King's villains. I think a lot of them are so great in the page that to put them on film yeah. is next to impossible. Yeah, yeah. like. Occasionally you get, you know, an Annie Wilkes and a Pennywise and Jack Torrance, but sometimes you end up with, you know, TV show Randall Flagg, which was okay, but way, way worse than what I wanted. You know, Randall Flagg is the, like, the devil of Stephen King's universe. That's a, those are big shoes. I, I expect a lot when it comes to that guy. Yeah. And Matthew McConaughey didn't pull it off either. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> Yeah. Lord have mercy. No, he did not. One day we're going to do the Dark Tower on this show, and I'm going to lose my shit because I I am so pissed off at that movie. Yeah, man. For for as great of a run McConaughey had there, like in the you know 2013 14 stretch, he he did he did you know he did that Dark Tower movie. He did Sea of Trees. Like, he's, what what are you doing, man? You just had this awesome run, and now you you just kind of sucked again there for a minute <laughs> <laughs> well also that film's biggest sin 
the Dark Tower series are eight books strong, yeah. all averaging between 300 pages to 1,000 pages long. And you, they took eight books, crunched them together into an unrecognizable hour and a half PG-13 fantasy thriller. <laughs> Starring Matthew McConaughey. Who is this for, if not the King fans, the big time King fans who spent hours, weeks, months going through the Dark Tower books, enjoying the, you know, Roland's journey from hardened warrior to hardened warrior with a family. (laughs) It's such a great story. And to see it butchered like that hurt. Yeah, dude, I, I've read the first two. And I was reading them uh, a little prior to the movie coming out. And when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, it just deflated me. Like, ugh, shit. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it, it sort of hurt me, and I haven't picked the books up again since. And I will one day because I know they're great. My brother and you adore them. Uh, my, old, my older brother, Jeremy, is a big Stephen King fan as well. And he, he loves those books. and. I'll never forget the disappointment when that movie came out. Just all of my friends, you know, and now you that now that I've known you, you know, this movie came out before uh, you and I really started hanging out and doing the podcast. But my God, had that movie come out while we were doing this podcast, we would have a hundred percent had to do an emergency alert, alert, shitty movie podcast because that, yeah, that was, that was one of the more disappointing movies of the decade for me. Oh, hands down. It's, yeah, me just sitting there in the theater, like, what is this shit? This is not the book I read. Like, yeah, yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah, uh, man. Well, refocus. It's, uh... <laughs> dark yeah. Half isn't that bad. Dark Half's not, it's not Dark Tower bad, thank God. What'd you uh, give Dark Tower? What's on your, your review for it? What'd you give it? I think it's a five. Yeah. I think, I liked Idris Elba's performance, but... Yeah, he has moments. Yeah. He's he's not playing the Roland that I read. Like this, that Roland had a goal. He wanted you know to find the tower to protect it. This Roland's like, who gives a fuck? Let it fall. I mean, <laughs> that's that's ridiculous. Not only do you like condense the books, make it PG thirteen, you also erase the main character's fucking motivation. <laughs> abandon, abandon. So yeah, uh, yeah. We could talk about it forever. One day we'll do that movie for fun. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> dark when the book, yeah when the book of filmgasm gives us the dark tower we'll get a full episode of Bush. it'll be a goddamn you know parade of just tearing that movie to pieces yeah it'll be an hour and a half of us just kicking the shit out of a dead horse yeah no we'll have to we'll make it like a little longer you know we usually try not to make the podcast longer than the movie but in that case we should make it a little longer just to just to fucking slap it in the face yes indeed uh, <laughs> moving oh, we on. Hate that movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oscar nominee Amy Madigan plays Liz Beaumont, Thad's wife. She was nominated for her performance in 1985's Twice in a Lifetime. She has also appeared in such films as Field of Dreams, Uncle Buck, Gone Baby Gone, and she appears in the recently released series Penny Dreadful: City of Angels. Liz is another character substantially watered down from the book. She has so much more to do in the book. Yeah, I would hope so because she's uh, God. This happens too many damn times in, in in movies that are messing with the horror genre. You have the the wife who's just like, "Come on, you're not even trying. You're not even trying with this character in this movie." Like, no, no shame on the actress. Just uh, shit, shitty character. Yeah, in the book. I'm going to be doing this a lot, by the way. In the That's, book. No, no, th- this, this is totally necessary with some episodes, yeah. Liz, uh, when she's captured by Stark, and we get that whole scene, by the way, in the book of Stark killing the cops and trashing the house and, like, all that was cut out of the movie. Uh, she is p- planning to kill him the entire time. She has, like, she has a pair of scissors hidden in her pants that she's, like, waiting to grab and like stab him when he gets close when he finds the scissors she grabs something else and hides it in the couch like she is very 
proactive in protecting her children and her husband. Like, it's very clear that she's not going down without a fight. In the movie, she's yeah, kind of passive and kind of just lets shit happen. Yeah. Ah, so frustrating. I hate that, man. Ha- that happens too much in these kind of movies. Yeah, it really does. And then for what I think is the biggest travesty, we have cult film actor Michael Rooker as Sheriff Alan Pangborn, a recurring King character who also appears in Needful Things, played by Ed Harris, and Hulu's Castle Rock series, played by Scott Glenn. Rooker has appeared in such films as Slither, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, and Guardians of the Galaxy. Walking Dead fans will know him as Southern shitbag Merle Dixon from the first three seasons of the show. And I love Michael Rooker, but he is so miscast as Alan Pangborn. It yeah, does not work. It, ugh, I picture somebody, you know, in their 50s, somebody who's been through the shit, somebody who is willing to, you know, put their mind out there a little bit more to believe that something like this could happen. And Michael Rooker just seems from the get-go, like he knows Thad's guilty and he's going to get him. And that's not the yeah. case of the book at all. At first, you know, Pangborn goes to see Thad and is like, I know you're guilty. And Thad explains his alibi. And Pangborn's like, well, shit, I guess you're not guilty. Let's do this together. Let's figure this out. Why is somebody after you? So he actually works with Thad to get to the root of this problem. He doesn't immediately accept that George Stark is real, but he, he starts thinking about – he's the one who finds out that uh, – that Thad had an operation to remove that twin. Okay, okay. Thad had no idea about that. He didn't, like, he was told it was a tumor. He never knew. He never met the doctor. The doctor getting killed, none of that's in the book. Okay. Pangborn's the one who finds out about the twin and starts thinking, oh, shit, maybe George Stark is real. And he goes to the cabin to find out and meets George Stark and is like, oh, shit, he was right. It's a great scene, and it's a great story arc, and we don't get any of that. Ugh, damn. You're kind of making me like it less. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend the book. It's a good read. It's a pretty quick yeah. read. Too. Yeah. Sounds awesome. You get a better version of this story. <laughs> but yeah, Michael Rooker is awesome. Uh, I have not yet seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. I've heard it's one of the most disturbing films ever made. Uh, but I've also heard it's like his definitive performance. So one day I'll you know, stomach that movie. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I love him as Yondu in the Guardians of the Galaxy films. He's fucking great. Oh, man. What, yeah, we'll have to find a way to um, tackle some of the Marvel movies at some point. You know, just... They're in the book. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. I put them the in the book, book. yeah. I added the, a whole bunch book. of sci-fi action and fantasy films. So. Good, good, good. I was going to suggest, yeah, we throw the MCU movies in there because I'll be fun to trip up on one of those one day. All the MCU movies are in there. All the DC movies are in there. The Fox X-Men movies, like the Superman films, anything I could think of are, goes in there. So Hell yeah. if it's a genre film, odds are it's in the book and we will do it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, they're the principal members of the cast. Uh, nobody else is really worth talking about, I don't think. The Dark no. Half has an IMDb score of 6.0. Rotten Tomatoes score of 56%. It was a box office dud, grossing only 10 mil on a budget of 15 mil. So that's a bummer. And uh, let's get into the plot. Let's try to unpack this thing. So we open in Castle Rock, Maine in 1968. We meet 13-year-old Thad Beaumont. He's a young kid, wants to be a writer, spends many hours in his bedroom writing violent stories with these little black pencils. And again, in the book... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the black pencils don't come into play until much later, and they're a pretty significant part of George Stark's character. But God, yep. <laughs> uh, his mother buys him a typewriter, and uh, he starts. After he starts using that, he starts having violent headaches, and he starts hearing birds, particularly sparrows. They coincide with the headaches, and uh, one day he's about to get on the school bus. He collapses, has a seizure, gets taken to the hospital, where x-rays reveal he's got a brain tumor and they have to operate fast the operation reveals that the growth in his brain is pretty grisly we actually see his piece of his skull get removed we don't that That was i don't need pretty gross (laughs) brain surgery is fucking gross and i don't want to see it (laughs) oh yeah i mean just thinking anytime you 
if you're yeah if you're someone who can who really imagery is big for you and of course horror mo- horror fans usually that's the case right and uh the, the brain when you think about it being touched or poked or anything where it's like being pressed at all you're just like it it, it messes with you a lot it's a it's a great way to open up a movie like this have you seen saw three? Oh yeah you remember the brain surgery scene? I know, I know. That's that's one of the first things that came to my mind. Yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah. While they're doing the, they remove the piece of skull and a fucking eyeball opens in Thad's brain, <laughs> and one of the nurses screams and runs out. And I love one of the other, like the doctors, like remember where you are. Like, you gotta have an iron fucking stomach to not freak the fuck out when you see an eyeball blink in someone's brain. <laughs> yeah, I find that to be the percentage of people that are okay with that in that room is, is off. Yeah, nobody even reacts. They're just like, all right, just one, move. just one person has a problem with that out of like eight. Come on. now. There was a line in the book that went even further in that. When the woman freaks out and runs out, the doctor says, find out her name. I want her fired. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. No freaking out on eyeball brain here. So, the operation reveals that the growth is actually a fetus that had started to develop. Uh, Thad was a twin in the womb, absorbed the other embryo. And even though the embryo was absorbed, it started growing inside Thad's head. And this is what was causing the headaches. So the growth is removed. And while the growth is removed, thousands of sparrows swarm the hospital and are seen outside just flying around like it's Hitchcock's the birds. And, uh, Again, the sparrows way better explained in the book as well. I'm sure. Yeah. That's, well, that's one of those things that, yeah, it's, it's tough to translate. Yeah. 23 years later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love, I love saying eh, it's something George Romero did, you know, like, I yeah, know we're, yeah. he could have done better. Some horror purists are going to kick our fucking asses for this one. Well, here's, yeah, there, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. That's fine. And I'm okay with that. I can take that, right? I I I'm used to I'm used to being the guy who's not as well well versed. Now, I feel the same way about Wes Craven though, right? Where it's like Oh yeah. Yeah, there's some good stuff, but it doesn't all hit. Just because his name's Craven doesn't mean shit to me, you know? Dude, two weeks ago um, we shit on Swamp Thing for an hour and a half. <laughs> exact exactly. And here here we are talking about Romero, who's yeah, looked at as one of the Titans. Yeah. And he may be he may be, you know? Mm-hmm. Depending on how you depending on how you look at it and the way the timing of those the dead movies, but uh nobody's untouchable. And um this is not yeah, this is just not that well crafted. There is no ass that gets kissed on filmgasm. Everyone no. has faults. And it's not yeah. like we're shitting on Dawn of the Dead here. I mean, this is the dark. No, act. yeah, no. And we'll, we'll of course, do those at some <laughs> point. We'll praise them. We will praise the show. Oh, they're great movies. Some, yeah, we praise great movies. movies and we, you know, we shit on bad ones. That's just how it works. <laughs> and, and, and we shit on the aspects that are bad about the good ones. Because that's, yeah. just, that's just how it, how it goes here. We call it like it is. Yes, we do. And the dark half has a lot of problems. We've got a lot of calling out to do. Yes, Sad. indeed. Thad, Thaddeus Beaumont. That sounds like the fucking pen name. Yeah, all right. That that's a name right there. Thad Beaumont. I I don't think of Timothy Hutton when I hear that name. You know what's Thaddeus Beaumont sounds like a disgraced like Civil War general. Yes, that like is played by like Christopher Walken, not not fucking Timothy Hutton. A grizzled Robert Duvall. <laughs> Just exactly exactly it's an awesome name king's great at names for sure oh yeah i mean well yeah they're probably just rolling around in his head all day i can't imagine like his thought processes like everything that happens to him has got to just be like that could be a story <laughs> that could be a story that could be a story like he can't turn that off <laughs> that's insane <laughs> no because i like reading yeah, the, the uh yeah. the afterword in his books because they'll always kind of explain a little bit of like where the idea came from and sometimes it'll literally just be like, I was walking through the parking lot and some guy was changing a tire. And when I went home, I wrote a story about that. <laughs> like, fuck. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> Cocaine. These days though, it's just, I don't know. He, he, like he's addicted to work. Like he just, yeah, no, he, yeah. Stop. I'm okay I think with that. 
I think he's found something that he's truly frightened of, which is losing his creativity, right? Like, because he's getting old. Well, uh, and eventually, eventually it's just, you know, it ends. And I think he's like, I got to keep doing this. Well, in the early 2000s, he was hit by that van. You know, he had a brush with death that really yes. changed him. Yeah. And ever since, he's just been, you know, on a nonstop kick. Just a tear. Yeah. It's been great work. A lot of it's been really, really good shit. Like, it's some of the best of his career, I think, in the past, like, five, six years. Yeah, that's so cool. Love that. <laughs> like, I just read his recent book, uh, his novella collection, Let, uh, If It Bleeds, which was really good. Four great stories. So, yeah, keep, it, keep on keeping on, Steve. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. King. I will man. keep reading it, that's for damn sure. Steve. <laughs> Um, so 23 years later, we meet Thad Beaumont. He's a successful writer who teaches a writing class at the local university. Another thing that comes up a lot more in the book is him as a teacher. Uh, nobody knows he's actually the writing novels under the name George Stark, violent, visceral, grisly novels that are praised for being just as over the top as you can fucking get. And these are the successful novels. He tried writing under his own name and the books just didn't sell. His agent says what my favorite line in the movie, and I don't remember this in the book, but it's a fucking great line. I read George Stark cause it's fun. I read Thad Beaumont cause it's my job. <laughs> that's great. That's that, that, that that's a jab. <laughs> yeah. Big time. <laughs> um, He's married to Liz. They have uh, twin children, uh, Wendy and William. I don't know if we ever hear the kids' names in the movie. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about that. The kids really aren't. Um, the kids and wife really aren't at times just like kind of a decoy in the movie, which I, I just can't stand. It. I can't stand when there's not depth to the, the family. They're very much a plot device. Like they're just there to get kidnapped. Yeah, I don't like that. It's in the book, we get a lot of insight into wendy and william's relationship like there's a scene there's a scene in the book where wendy falls off uh i think she falls down the stairs and she has a grisly bruise on her chest and william suddenly starts developing the same bruise despite not having fallen down the stairs like he because they're twins like he shares in the pain it really he did a great job exploring the nature of twins in that book none of that comes up in the movie frustrating um one day after class a strange man named fred clausen a show, shows up and addresses thad as george stark says can you sign my book and thad's like it's not me he's like yeah it is i know <laughs> this slimy little shit yeah dude he he's like a cricket from it's always sunny <laughs> <laughs> he totally was he was cricket Oh Ricky my Cricket. god! <laughs> oh, so Fred <laughs> reveals that he knows Thad's been using a pseudonym to write these novels, and he demands blackmail money to keep his mouth shut. And the only reason Thad's doing this is because he doesn't want celebrity status. He doesn't want his family's privacy to be violated. I get that. And uh, well, that's the reason he says. The real reason is George Stark came to life and said, "I'm gonna write this shit, and you're gonna you're gonna watch." <laughs> 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 basically what happened and uh thad says like i'll think about it and uh signs his book george stark i love that he doesn't Me sign too. thad beaumont he signs it george stark that was a nice touch yeah this whole thing happens way different in the book as well I, uh after he goes public clausen calls him and is like you son of a bitch way to cut me out <laughs> okay wow I wish we gotten to see that. That would have been awesome. <laughs> I know, especially with Klaus. And uh, Thad goes home and tells his wife what's going to happen. And he's like, she's like, well, why don't you just come clean? And he's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to. I'd rather not pay blackmail money. And if I do it myself, you know, it'll maybe jumpstart my own book sales. And the start catalog will probably, you know, double in sales. So he calls his agent and his, his agents are uh, Miriam and, uh, Rick, I think it was. Rick Cowley, I think. Well, anyway, his agents are both like, yeah, this is a great idea. Go ahead. 
we totally support you. And then as soon as he hang up, hangs up, they're like, shit, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> That's our cash cow right there. George Stark sells. People like reading about fucked up shit. And yeah, it's true. There's so much of King's own career in this, in this story. <laughs> I know, man. I know. Um, <laughs> so he comes clean. He organizes a, uh, a reporter to come interview him. He's revealed. George Stark is huge in this world, by the way. You know, it's not like just, you know, some you know, local writer. George Stark is an international best-selling author. So this is big news. And uh, the reporter and the uh, journalist, I mean, the um, photographer they send with him decide to have a fake burial for George Stark. They go to Castle Rock Cemetery. They put a big fake George Stark tombstone. His epitaph says, not a very nice guy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And Thad's almost like he's sad to kind of bury George Stark. This is, you know, he's his constant writing partner. Some of his best work came out of George Stark. So he's kind of sad to let this go. And uh, he has a, the photographer, Homer Gamash, by the way, is in the book. Homer Gamash is just some, some guy who, some trucker dude. And the photographer is somebody else. They just decided to combine those two characters to save time. Uh, a few days later, local grave digger calls the police when he discovers a large hole at the gravesite where the fake grave was. Like somebody crawled out. It's crazy. <laughs> and uh, soon, everyone who knew about George Stark, everyone connected to Thad starts getting murdered brutally. The photographer, Homer Gamash, gets picked up by, uh, picks up a hitchhiker and then gets beaten to death with his own prosthetic leg. I mean, fuck. <laughs> that's, that's personal. Right there. Talk about, talk about grizzly. And then he drove Homer's blood-covered truck to a uh, parking lot and stashed it. Like, he's got very clear fingerprints everywhere. And we're led to believe pretty much from the get-go that this is George Stark who came to life to, for revenge for Thad killing him off like this. Uh, he gets Miriam, home, uh, one of... Thad's agents gets her in New York. This was pretty brutal. This was done pretty much just like it was in the book. This was done really well. It was really unsettling. He drags her into her apartment, uh, slices her face, makes her call Thad to tell her she's going to die, to tell him she's going to die. And then she leaves a message. He cuts the phone cord and then cuts her throat. It's really fucked up. Yeah. (laughs) And Sheriff Alan Pangborn shows up at Thad's house saying, you know, you're, you're under suspicion of murder. We found your prince at the crime scene. And Homer was a friend of Pangborn, so he's taking this very personally. And Thad is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was in New York. I can, you know, I have alibis. I didn't do this. And uh, he says, you know, check out that guy, Fred Clausen. He was weird. Maybe he did this. And they check him out, and he's been brutally murdered as well his dick was cut off and shoved in his mouth and he was the because that's what you do to a squealer that's what george stark would do to a squealer <laughs> jesus christ uh, yeah that part is crazy when he says that uh when thad says it like around his family yeah and then it's yeah <laughs> <laughs> and the phrase the sparrows are flying again is written in blood on the wall very Harry Potter like, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm kidding. That, <laughs> that phrase and the I, that makes it okay. <laughs> so yeah, t- take your time. Yeah, <laughs> the sparrows in the book are a representation of Thad's ability to control George Stark, which does not come up much in the film. Stark knows nothing about the birds. So Thad uses these birds to take control of George at random times to learn things. And in the end, he uses these sparrows to fuck him up. And I wish we'd gotten a little bit more of an explanation of that in the film, because if you haven't read the book, you're a little lost in what the hell that's all supposed to be. And nah, just it, it could have been, to- been said better. Yeah, it could be. Uh, that's a really cool representation. Yeah. 
Very cool. Uh, Thad calls Sheriff Pangborn with a message, you know, says like, hey, Miriam left a message on my on machine. I think she's dead. You got to call the NYPD. They got to check on her. And they find her dead in her apartment. And Thad's starting to get, you know, freaked out. Everyone he knows is being murdered because of him. And they send a, uh, they put a uh, tracer on Thad's phone and immediately George calls him. And Thad knew it was him. He answers, what do you want, you son of a bitch? And <laughs> there's shit, certain scenes shit. in this that are done really well. Yes, yes. And George is like, hold on now, that's not very nice. Like, he has a southern drawl. He's from Mississippi. And uh, he tells, he lies and tells Thad, you know, oh, it's over. I'm not doing it anymore. I did what I had to do, and it's over. And Thad's like, I don't believe you. You stay the fuck away from my family. And George is saying this because he knows that he's being traced. So he's, you know, giving them a bone. But it's far from over. <laughs> uh, there's that one scene where, Thad, where uh, Stark finds um, Mike Donaldson, the journal, the reporter, and like, just keeps slashing him in the hallway. That was fucked up. When the guy, like, he's yelling help, and that guy opens the door, and he's like, what's going on in here? And Stark's like, murder. You want some? <laughs> like, fuck. <laughs> There's there's really good bits in this film. It's done really well at times, for sure. Awesome aspects. Yeah. And that, that, you know, uh, I, we are dealing with Romero. We've talked about how he is great and has this huge stature. So yes, there are moments that are fucking awesome. Yeah. And like this isn't the first Romero film we've done. By the way, we did Creep Show way back near the beginning. So yeah, that. you're right. You're right. That's one that I think is due for a redo in the, in the future. All the ones I did by myself, I would like to redo with our, you know. Typical format. But uh, yeah, we like Romero. And he's really good at establishing tone at times. And I think the Stark murders are some of the best scenes in this film. Yeah, like, I agree. They're really creepy. <laughs> yeah, I just wish everything else around it in the second part of the movie was, was a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he, he kills that guy, kills Mike Donaldson, sneaks into Thad's publisher, Rick Cowley. I was right. And uh, slashes him to death. He uses a straight razor. That's his typical weapon of choice. Kills two cops who were there as guards. Stark goes through cops like fucking tissue paper. It's ridiculous. He kills so many cops. (laughs) And uh, after this, Stark calls that again, threatens to kill everybody he knows unless he starts writing novels as George Stark again. Says he wants to write another book. And we learn later on that the reason Stark wants to write another book is because he's waiting, he's fading away. He's rotting because he's not real in the fullest sense of the word. Fad is real. Stark is more of a manifestation. He's more of a projection. Yes. And it, 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 he needs the book, the Stark novels to stay alive. Now I always like the way I saw it was uh, George Stark to me is a tulpa uh being yeah. made of like a being manifested from belief. Like if you believe it's real, it will come to life. And that's what I think George Stark is because of those millions of readers reading George Stark novels and thinking, this guy's a great writer. I'd love to meet him someday. Yeah, the yeah, I agree with you. I think the energy surmounts into an actual being. Yeah. That 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 is walking around terrorizing stuff. Yep. Super but freaky. After, but after Thad killed Stark ceremoniously and, you know, announced that he's the real writer, belief started to fall apart. And now Stark, you know, is, fall, is dying. I don't know. I, there's a lot of ways you can read into this. You can even read that it was Thad the whole time and he's schizophrenic and fucking nuts. Yeah, yeah. It's up Which to you what, to, uh, to yeah. interpret it. That's what Pangborn believes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So Thad, uh, uses the birds. He realizes that he can control these birds to kind of peek into George's mind. And he does that at the university and starts, that's where he finds out Stark's dying. But then Stark realizes it and says, get out of my head and makes him stab himself in the hand with the pencil. (laughs) And those pencils, uh, Stark would only ever write his novels in longhand. He would fill pages with these pencils. 
And that, again, really doesn't matter in the movie. <laughs> but it's huge in the book. Thad, when he's going to face Stark, grabs, goes to a store and buys his own pencils as, like, a weapon. So yeah. Stark can't, like, take control of them because he's never touched those pencils. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Thad decides he's got to investigate where George Stark came from. So he goes to see the doctor who treated his brain tumor. And he tells him about the underdeveloped fetus he found in his brain. And Stark just shows up and kills the doctor in another room and then leaves. <laughs> and Thad's like, hey, doctor, and finds his body and leaves and says, like, you might want to call the cops to the people in the waiting room. It's so fucking guilty. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. He's framing his ass and uh, Thad is like, huh. Thad's hair flops around a little bit. And he's like, what do I do? <laughs> God damn it. None of that is in the book. In the book, the doctor is on a vacation in Yellowstone and Pangborn is constantly trying to get a hold of him and finally does. And that's when the doctor tells Pangborn, oh yeah, we found a fetus in his head. And Pangborn's like, oh shit, George Stark. And he puts it all together. Thad, I don't think ever finds out about this. Ah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's weird and lazy. And, uh, Thad flees from the cops. Stark calls him again and says, guess where I'm calling from? He's abducted his wife and kids and threatens to kill them unless he meets at the Summer Lake house and starts writing as George Stark again. So much just gets passed over from the book. They really just, like, they, they put in the key scenes, but they took the bridges out. Like, there's nothing really getting us to the scenes anymore. We're just like, all right, this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and then the movie's over. We have no build-up to anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's frustrating. Uh, Thad confides in a professor colleague named Reggie. Tells him all, or uh, she tells him that Stark's embodiment was a result of Thad encouraging his dark side to start writing. And that in order for Thad to defeat Stark without killing himself, he has to confront his dark half. None of this is in the book either. (laughs) Reggie tells Thad that the appearance of the sparrows are conduits of the bringers of life or death. And whoever's in control is the one who can wield the sparrows and determine who's going to die and who's going to live. And the stronger one typically can control these. And right now it's Thad, but if Thad starts writing as Stark again, it's going to be Stark. (laughs) <laughs> so Jesus. in the book he's got a colleague who studies mythology who also doesn't believe that well actually no, uh, Thad doesn't tell him about Stark he just says like hey what are sparrows in mythology and he looks it up and he finds out about the psychopomps as he calls them uh, then he takes his car and says like when this is all over you got to tell me what the hell's going on Thad's like, all right, I will. So Thad drives out to the Summer Lake House where he confronts George Stark face to face, who is now just fucked up. He's covered in bandages and bleeding like pus. Looks like a golem. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, he has Stark's kids. I mean, he has uh, Thad's kids and Liz is tied up in the living room. Stark forces Thad to start writing a new book about Alexis Machine, Stark's main character. Thad tries to solve for time, starts discussing the violent nature of the book. Thad starts writing and tells Stark to take over the writing. And as Stark starts writing, we see Stark's wounds start to heal and Thad starts having his wounds. So he's, the transfer is happening. And uh, while this is happening, millions of sparrows are coming up around the house. Thad is using his willpower to bring the sparrows here. This is so much more significant in the fucking book. (laughs) It's so frustrating because the movie, it means nothing. But in the book, it's like, oh shit, it's finally happening. (laughs) God damn it. George, what happened? (laughs) George. (laughs) Ugh. (laughs) So... Thad tries to grab Stark's gun and Stark grabs him and is like, don't do anything stupid. Just ride this out or, you know, and I won't kill your children. 
And Thad's like, no, and jumps on him, and they, they have a scuffle. And uh, Stark nearly shoots one of his kids, and Thad hits him with the typewriter. And the sparrows that are pr- like attacking the house start coming through the win- windows and the, w- and the walls and attack Stark and start ripping him to pieces. Meanwhile, Alan Pangborn shows up for some reason. <laughs> and how the hell did he know where they were going in this, in this movie? He knew where they were in the book because it made sense. And he just fights his way through the birds, helps Liz out of the chair, and just kind of holds her back as upstairs Stark is ripped to pieces by these birds. And they just carry his corpse away well, into, like, the great wide open <laughs> as Thad and Liz and the twins kind of look on. Pangborn's, I guess, in the corner somewhere. And the movie's fucking over. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's like, the... Oh, it's... It's barely recognizable at times. The ending is fucking ridiculous. <sighs> yeah, absurd. And you you feel like you're on this roller coaster that just instead of it having that ultimate like you know whoosh, you're going on a loop de loop, it just has like a dead end. You're like oh, it's, all right. It's a roller coaster that you know you keep going up and up and up and up and up, and then you get to the top, and it's just an even path that goes like to 25 miles an hour. Just like, all right. And then you get off. Just gonna <laughs> just gonna just gonna go. Yeah. All right. God damn it, George. Yeah, frustrating, man. I know you obviously you you have the connection to the book. I I, I just think it from a as like a, a horror movie, which I don't think it is a total horror movie, but you know, if it if it has one genre, I guess that would be it. And I, I think one I think they should have, if they're going to hone in on something, really hone in on it and focus on it. I don't think the movie needs to be two hours when they clearly didn't know what exactly they wanted to figure out about this story, right? Yeah. Like you said, it, it, like you said a, a, a few times, this, makes, this means so much more in the book, has so much more significance, the sparrows and that sort of thing. And, that, and, and Liz, his wife, that's really frustrating. Yeah. Because you, if you're going to give two hours to a film, you would like to think that there's going to be that depth there. Yep. But if there's not, if there's not, and you're going to rely on, you know, Timothy Hutton doing some fun stuff and the Stark character being creepy, I just don't think it needs to be this long. Uh, for that reason, I, I give it a seven overall. I think it's got some good aspects, but uh, I was disappointed at times. I too would give it a seven, mostly because I, I do enjoy Timothy Hutton's performance and I do yeah. like the first half of the movie, really. And, uh, just the big thing that the film loses is the relationship between Thad Beaumont and George Stark. You feel that they've been together forever in the book, that they've always like looked out for one another in a weird way. And then Stark is so hurt by being cast aside that he's willing to do anything to get back into Thad's good graces. He wants Thad to care about him more than anything. You, He's so layered in the book. Everyone's so layered because King's a goddamn great storyteller, but it's so lost in translation here that Stark just becomes another caricature. And the relationship is nearly gone. Yeah. Nah. (laughs) Bummer. Uh, Well, here's some film guys and facts for you. Number one, in the prologue, Thad Beaumont wants to become a writer and he's shown writing stories. The title of his first typewritten story is Here There Be Tigers, which is also the real title of the first short story King ever wrote. And uh, the story can be found in his anthology collection, Skeleton Crew. And I've read it and it's a very weird story. <laughs> Here There Be Tigers. Basically, a, uh, a kid in school goes into the bathroom and sees a tiger and is like, hey, everybody, there's a fucking tiger in the bathroom. And the teachers are like, stop lying, get back to your chair. And then the tiger eats somebody. Jesus. <laughs> is, original doesn't always mean good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. But very it is true. the first thing he ever wrote. And it's cool that he included that in his you know, collections. <laughs> Number two, and I don't think this will surprise you one bit. According to George Romero, Timothy Hutton was quite difficult to work with at times. Hutton <laughs> even quit the film for a few days during production. 
Yeah. He yeah, seems like that kind of guy. Yeah. Well, yeah. And as, as we've seen in more recently, some allegations come out and uh, yeah, we're not big Hutton fans here at film guys. And number three, until the Stephen King-based film 1922 came out in 2017, The Dark Half was the most faithful adaptation of a King work to ever be filmed. This was possibly because writer-director George Romero and King were good friends. That, what does that say about the rest of King's work? <laughs> that this, which cut out so much, was the most faithful adaptation. <laughs> Crazy. I would argue that, like, I don't think that's true. I think Misery is a much better adaptation. Uh, if we're talking, like, pre, like, 1993. Yeah. Stand yeah. by me. Uh, yeah. Josh Shank hadn't happened yet, regrettably. Uh, yeah, just literally a year later. Crazy. Uh, fucking Carrie, maybe? <laughs> there you go. Someone's talking shit, because that's there's no way in hell this is the most well-adapted. Oh. No. No, no, no. Uh, there is a remake slated for development with MGM with uh, seen that. Alex Ross Perry set to write and direct. And he's the writer of her smell and Christopher Robin. So I don't know. It's a weird we'll see. pick Christopher Robin. Like, Hey, make a Stephen King movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have um, fun. <laughs> and yeah, I give it a seven. Romero did what he could, but some things just don't translate all that well from page to screen. And Hutton does a great job. I think the rest of the cast is underwhelming and forgettable. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, this this is um, one of those though that if you if you are a big King fan, you gotta check it out though. You know, it's it's got some stuff that you you'll really dig. And uh, if you if you like his stuff from especially from the you know the night eighties nineties, then check it out. Yeah. I sat, I mean, you know, I sat through the three and a half hour Salem's Lot miniseries that I thought was boring and shit. So I, I, I'll watch fucking anything that like King's got his name on. If I can watch that. And yeah. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Ugh. <laughs> well, that takes us into the spotlight where we talk about some of the films we've been watching outside the podcast. Uh, why don't you start us off? What have you been checking out lately? Uh, a lot of stuff, you know, we're always watching a bunch of stuff, but I like to really uh, focus on one film. Uh, I'm going to try to, as we do the spotlight, otherwise I'll, I'll ramble on for, for days, my man. So I'm going to go with a movie I recently reviewed. You can check out that review on filmgasm.com. That's the movie directed by Radu Munten from Romania. That's Tuesday after Christmas from 2010. Uh, this is a movie that I found on the Criterion channel because I, used to live in Romania for for some time back when I was 17 and 18 and um you know I had some very very good experiences there and I miss it quite a lot and I felt like oh man I should check out some Romanian films you know there's there's actors that are Romanian that I like and um there's been you know I've read some stuff and Tuesday After Christmas is one that I've read that's one of the better ones of the decade. And it's, that's true. This movie is jaw dropping, incredible cinematography, incredible acting. It's about um, a man and a wife who are seemingly very dedicated to one another, but the, the man is cheating and sleeping with a younger woman. And it's a classic, I, I would compare it to something like if you, if you like more, you know, if you really dig into American films, like something like Marriage Story, it's similar to that. Um, very raw, very authentic. At times you feel very uncomfortable because you're like, oh shit, this is what people really go through. And there's a, there's a certain showdown that goes down between husband and wife towards the end of the film. That is, that is one of the more impressive scenes I've watched lately. Um, again, I have a connection to Romania because I lived there for a little bit. So I'm going to try to watch more Romanian stuff. But um, I, I encourage people, if you feel connection to any country, um, I know you recently went to Colombia. Yeah. There's a, there's a huge Colombian noir section on a Criterion Channel. And it's a bunch of, you know, noir films from, you know, years ago that are Colombian, you know. Wow. And I, I encourage people that feel a connection to any, any nation, uh, whether it be somewhere in Europe or Africa or wherever, to seek out films from those places. Um, you, can, you can learn a lot 
if you're someone who watches movies a bunch already like us, then you should probably throw in some stuff that's going to teach you some stuff here and there. Right. Um, movies are great distractors, but they can also be great teachers, great teachers. One of my favorite teachers of all time uh, are, are movies. And I think this is one of those that you can uh, Tuesday after Christmas is one of those. If you happen to have any connection to Romania, I highly, highly suggest it. It's very cool. There's certain things you see in Bucharest, the capital that are awesome. So love this movie. I gave it a nine. Um, I think on a second rewatch, it could move up to a 10. It's that kind of movie where it's like, whoa, just washes over you uh, like a wave and uh, v- very good. What have you been checking out lately? Um, I, nothing that poignant. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, hey, I, I don't, I don't, I don't always watch something that, that heavy and I'm not always watching Romanian stuff. So, <laughs> uh, I've been, uh, mostly w- working my way through Netflix. Like I have been for the past few months. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what's like been the past like three or so you've knocked out off there. I watched the 2005 remake of bad news bears. Uh, starring Billy Beautiful. Bob Thornton. I had no idea it was Richard Linklater. That was a, that yeah, was a bombshell. And uh, it was way funnier than I expected. It was a uh, Billy Bob is just a funny fucking dude. The way like the the insults that man comes up with is funny as hell. And uh, yeah, it was just an endearing you know sports comedy. Like you know they're gonna fucking lose, but you know that it's gonna be a you know learning experience. And I thought it was funny. Uh, another one yeah, I watched. I love that movie. <laughs> it was it was good. Uh, the Squid and the Whale. I watched that. Oh boy! Oh boy! And it was it was good, but God, what terrible people! <laughs> All of them are such monsters. They're just arrogant intellectuals who shit on anybody who doesn't have a fucking doctorate. It's the, the I hate those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The best way to describe that movie to someone who hasn't seen it, if you like Noah Baumbach, go for it. You know, yeah. um, it. My favorite part of that movie to kind of like talk about when I talk about Squid and Whale is there's a scene when Jesse Eisenberg's character is at school, and one of his classmates is reading This Side of Paradise uh, by F. Scott Fitzgerald, and he's like, "Oh, it's Meyer Fitzgerald." <laughs> <laughs> What an he's, asshole. Like, well, he's like, you should read Gatsby, not Paradise, because that's Meyer Fitzgerald. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Ugh. God. I hate anybody who just fills their head with what they think is culturally and like societally important instead of just like watching and reading what you want. Enjoy yourself. We're only here for a small amount of time. So why the fuck would you want to just, you know, cut out things that you think would be fun in, in favor of just trying to impress assholes like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you, you got you to gotta learn what you like, you know, and, yeah. and dig into it. Well, and like the parents are, I mean, Jeff Daniels is such a prick in that movie. Him and, Le- yeah, they, it, there's some career defining kind of performances in that movie. It's, yeah. um, yeah, you definitely don't like anybody. Yeah. No. Nah, even the kid, even the um the, the kid, the little brother is really a shit. Like, you know, he's down in Jack and private. He's, you know, just being such a weird kid. Getting uh, loaded. Yeah. I was laughing my ass off when Jesse Eisenberg accidentally like whacked Anna Paquin in the nose. Yeah, dude, me too. <laughs> there goes your night, asshole. <laughs> Dickhead. <laughs> But then, you know, Laura Linney, like, every time they're talking to her, like, she mentions another affair she had. Like, she's sleeping with their tennis teacher. (laughs) Baldwin. Fucking Baldwin, yeah. 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 Yeah, It was a great movie. It was Powerful. Noah Baumbach is becoming the divorce guy. Like, why is that? Do you think? Like, do you think he's just always been surrounded by divorce? Yeah, and in New York, and... That's where he, that's, that's, that's his, like, it's like in his blood, you know, New York, Brooklyn. Yeah. These areas where he grew up and he, he very much uses personal experience to, to make movies. And I, I love that. I don't think everybody should do that. I don't think every filmmaker, I don't think that's their bag, but I think Noah Baumbach was made, like, was meant to tell stories about his own life. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I adore him. I mean, I, I think Francis Haw is one of the 
one of the stronger movies from the decade, I think. Uh, the Meyerowitz Stories is one of the better Netflix movies with some unbelievable performances from Sandler and Stiller. Um, never thought I'd say that in the same sentence, but yeah, no, Bombach has a way. He's got a way of talking about New York people, talking about people who are broken, and uh, it's it's good shit. I'm excited to see what he does next. Do you think that in the Squid and the Whale is he supposed to be, like? I'm assuming it's based on his parents' divorce. I think he's supposed to be the youngest kid. Is my I mean I don't think I don't think any of it is that like set in stone. But I think yeah he's he's. I think he put himself in yeah. I, mean, yeah, I hope he's yeah. not more like Jesse Eisenberg because that would just be unfortunate. No, I know. I, I think he, yeah, I think he had issues with what, from what I've read, he had issues with like who to look up to sort of thing. And that, that very much shows with the youngest child in that movie. Um, yeah. When you, yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine with the parents that I grew up with. Um, my childhood was, was awesome. I was able to ask kind of, you know, questions and stuff. So yeah. I just don't, I, I, I can't imagine my dad being like, this is what you have to read because everything else is for losers, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, God, uh, you know, I grew up in a loving family as well. And I just, I can't imagine having that kind of pressure 24 seven of just, you know, my parents are geniuses and they know best. Yeah. Like, my parents were crazy. just glad I was reading at some point, you know, like they're like, Oh great. He's reading Captain Underpants. That's good. Just, just keep, you do yeah. something. Well, I was always encouraged to, you know, follow my creativity and, you know, find what I liked on my own. And that's yeah. how it yeah, should yeah. be. You should never be told, like, don't watch this. That's terrible. Watch this, even though that is exactly what we do every week. But <laughs> still, I mean, we're not, yeah. not in that way. No, I, I, and I did say, watch this movie if you're a King fan. Watch the Dark Half. I, I don't think it's for everybody, and I don't think everybody's searching for the dark half, you know? I, I certainly wasn't until I heard of it. Yeah. But I think it, ha- I think it has a place. Every movie, you, you said earlier, too, is what's great is when a movie's so bad, we can talk about it. I yeah. mean, talk about, talk about, think about The Room. It has an entire, it, it has an entire, you know, like, cultural impact because of how bad it is. That's it. And, and I agree with you. It, it is like, there's like a line you can like kind of cross sometimes where you're like, you should or shouldn't watch this. But <laughs> ultimately here on Filmgasm, we believe you should, you should check everything out for yourself. We, we really do. Yeah. Um, and, and there is always going to be things that I'll try to like kind of steer away from just because I know what I am going to fill my personal time with. But when it comes to doing this podcast and searching for stuff, you got to be open. True. Very true. And all we've ever really done is given, you know, the audience, you guys suggestions. I mean, we give our two cents on the films we pick and you can either, you know, roll with that and decide, well, they said it was shit. I, I guess I won't watch it. Or they said it was awesome. I guess I'll check it out. Or, you know, you can contest us say like, well, I heard that was, that was a great movie. I'll check that out myself. You know, we're not, you know, we're not experts by any sense of the word. We're just no, fans no. who love talking about movies and that's it really. <laughs> I mean, there's, yeah. there's no, yeah. you know, magic to this show. It's just, we like movies and we want to talk about them. Yeah, man. It's yeah. It's, it, it's definitely a thing that keeps us moving. We've, we've, we're always going to talk about what's going on in the world, but ultimately film guys is a movie podcast. We can, we're, we're always going to say that hammer at home, but uh, we're just going to talk about movies and continue to do that. And, uh, I always want to highlight our other podcast, right? Oscar Sunday, because yeah. it's uh, you know it's it's brand new, and we just have we're just four episodes in. Uh, we've done Pulp Fiction, To Five Bloods, Rocky, In the Bedroom, just some really good films. So if you want to go check those out, uh, this upcoming week we're going to be doing The Great Dictator from 1940. So that's that's going to be a blast. We're going we're probably going to record that on July 4th. Uh, so that's really cool. Yeah, we um, are. Yeah, so that, that that's pretty that's pretty amazing. We're gonna be doing a movie that's eighty years old. <laughs> yeah, so we're having a blast with that so far, and uh, keep coming back, guys. We really appreciate it. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I know that we've recently hit two thousand downloads. That may not be a lot to the big podcast out there, but to us, that's everything. Yeah, man. Uh, we just hit fifty YouTube subscribers again. Not big potatoes. But it's, you know, it's small potatoes, but it's our potatoes. Yes. And I'm proud of those numbers, damn it. I'm proud of those potatoes. 
Damn straight. Those are great potatoes. <laughs> um, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the dark half. God knows we didn't. Uh, <laughs> next week. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> next we week. We give it a seven. Yeah, seven. I mean, it's a it soft passes. seven, though. <laughs> it, it passes, though. It does pass. <laughs> next week, we go back to found footage horror with a 2014 dud that we are going to give a second chance to. A team of explorers ventures deep into the Paris catacombs and uncovers dark secrets about the city's numerous dead. The book of filmgasm giveth and the book taketh away. Next week, we dive into as above, so below. If it's as bad as I've heard, then we will have a fun time ripping it to shreds. Or, you know, maybe it's a secret gem that everyone hated, but we'll find something to like. That yeah, happens. man, I've, I've seen it before, but I, I can't remember much of it because I kind of was dozing off. So we'll see. Not a good, <laughs> not a good start, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens on the rewatch. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And uh, if you want to, you know, watch along with us, uh, that movie is available on Netflix. So that's where yes. we're going to be watching it. Yes. Also this Sunday, tune into Oscar Sunday. Here's talk about the great dictator in the 1941 Oscars until then, if you're a writer, keep writing. But if you start to hear sparrows, Maybe put the black pencil down and switch to Microsoft Office like the rest of us. See you next Wednesday. Mm-hmm.